So what is chronic venous disease? Well, one of the things is that you also hear that's frequently called venous insufficiency or leaky valves. And this is a problem with your veins. Remember, veins return blood from your body back to your heart. And chronic venous disease is actually a really, really old problem. It was first described as varicose veins by Hippocrates in 400 BC. But it really wasn't until we were using the advanced, you know, as ultrasound was advancing their technology that we had a way to diagnose it. And then in around 2002, the FDA ap approved lasers for, um, as a way to treat it so we didn't have to use the old fashioned stripping. So now with a way to diagnose it and a way to treat it, uh, phlebology really um, had a, a world of its own. And phlebo means veins, ology means the study of. So phlebology is actually the field of medicine that's dedicated to treating the problems with veins. We were recognized by the AMA in 2006 and by the American Osteopathic Association. And then in 2009, the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine was formed. So this is a relatively new um, field of medicine when you think about uh, medicine in general. So why is it important? Well, one of the reasons it's important is because it's a very common cause for these symptoms in the leg, tired, achy, heavy. And you'll notice that these are really the same symptoms that you see with lipedema as well. The one difference is, is that when you have these symptoms from chronic venous disease, they occur at the end of the day. So if you're waking up with these symptoms, that's probably your lipedema and not your venous disease. But lipedema, um, Durkham's and chronic venous disease all have a lot in common. They're chronic, which means they're long-standing, they're progressive, they're more common in women, and they mainly affect the lower body. They're also a very common problem in the population. They share many of the same symptoms. Inflammation uh, is involved, the capillaries and lymphatics are involved, but we just don't really know much about this relationship. We suspect a link, but it's mainly anecdotal information. So who gets chronic venous disease? Well, early on in the 1800s, they really suspected that genetics was a big component. So the varicose veins are the result of an improper selection of grandparents, all right? And they actually got it right back in the 1800s because genetics is the, really the number one cause for venous disease, both in women and in men. But venous disease is more common in women because of pregnancy and female hormones. It actually gets worse with each pregnancy, and we're talking about hormones since puberty. We're not talking about replacement hormone. So this is one of my favorite slides. This is, shows the genetics that, uh, in uh, venous disease. And this is the, the granddaughter uh, on the left. She actually had some varicose veins in her cap, which didn't show up very well, the aunt and the grandmother. We ended up treating the mother as well. But you can look at the arch of their foot and see that they are actually uh, related. So what causes venous disease? Well, the first thing we really need to do is go over the anatomy. And then the leg, we have two full, well-developed vein systems, the deep vein system and the superficial system. The deep vein system carries about 90% of the blood at any given time in your leg, and it's actually the most important. It's a super critical system. We put it on a pedestal, we leave it alone, and treat it with a lot of love and care. But the superficial system is actually between the muscle and the skin, but it's deep enough under the skin that you can't see most of it. It carries about 10% of the um, blood in the leg at any given time, and it is essentially a reservoir. There's no arteries with this system. There are no nerves with this system. So it's, um, and we can eliminate some of these veins when they are problematic. So the two main veins in the superficial system are the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. And if you can imagine, um, I don't know if I have the pointer. I'm not supposed to use a pointer because we have a couple of screens. Anyway, um, it starts as a circle drive on the top of your foot. So if the blood decides to go on the inside, it goes up the great saphenous vein all the way up the leg into the groin, into the deep system to get the blood back out of the leg and back to the heart. And if the blood decides to go on the outside of the, um, the, the, the ankle, it goes up the small saphenous vein, which ends behind the knee in the deep system there. Now remember, Veins are designed to get the blood out of the leg, and we have to do that against gravity. So how do we get the blood uphill against gravity? Well, we were given a heart in our chest to pump blood to our feet, but we weren't given a heart in our feet to pump it back. But we were given flow valves and leg muscles. So one of the most important thing with moving the blood and the fluid out of your leg is the calf foot pump, which you've already heard about a couple of times today. 
So when you walk, that's the pressure on the foot actually primes the calf. And then as you complete that, that step, the calf actually squeezes the blood out. So having an effective foot calf pump is incredibly important for moving the blood out of the leg. Um, one of the things that happens is if you start to have a gait abnormality, you start to shuffle a little more and then you start walking with your hips. And I call that the tight tush because you're starting to really walk with your hips and not walking with your heel and toe. So as your gait disorders really start to progress, you lose the, the calf um, foot pump. The other thing is this is a normal flow valve. So we were given flow valves to actually help move the blood toward the heart. These flow valves are more numerous in the leg than anywhere, and they act like one-way double doors keeping the blood moving toward the heart. So as you walk, the, the leg muscles squeeze the blood up, the valves close, squeeze the blood up, the valves close. And this is how we were designed to help move blood against gravity. Well, what happens if these valves don't function or the vein wall is weak? Then what happens, your, your legs squeeze the blood up, but the valves are leaky or weak, and they allow the blood to flow back down toward your ankle. This is called reflux. So anytime fluid goes in the wrong direction, it's called reflux. So acid reflux is when the blood, I mean the acid's supposed to flow into your intestines, but it doesn't, it splashes back up. Venous reflux is when the blood's supposed to go back up to your heart, but it instead flows back down. Well, when you have venous reflux, this is the, actually what is the main cause of venous disease when the blood is flowing downhill. So what happens? Well, I like to use this water balloon analogy. So in the morning, your leg veins are empty because you've been asleep all night. Your legs are draining that blood out and gravity is draining them out to your hips. But as you start to stand and stand as the day progresses, the blood flows downhill and the leg gets heavier and heavier. So at the end of the day, a heavy leg gets tired. And most people don't want to keep standing. They just want to elevate their feet and, and drain that blood out of them. So this is actually what really happens with venous disease. So the first thing that happens, you get an overfilling phenomenon. That overfilling makes the leg heavy. Then a heavy leg gets tired. Then those vein walls get thin and cause some swelling. Those nerves in those vein walls start to um, get activated, causing the discomfort associated with venous disease. And then some people actually have those mast cells in the vein walls, which release histamine. And some people actually get itching in their legs because of this as well. Another thing that happens is vein dilation. So I like people to think about this as a river. I said when a river flows downhill to accommodate more water, sometimes the banks of the river get wide. Well, when the blood flows downhill in a vein to accommodate more vein, um, to accommodate more blood, the banks of the vein get wide. So we do measure the banks of the vein to um, see if this is, if your venous disease is actually progressing. Now one of the main misconceptions about varicose veins is that most of them are under the skin and you can't see them, all right? Um, so almost everybody has some, when you have venous disease, has big varicose veins under the skin that you can't see. But where do these visible varicose veins come from? Well, if you can imagine this is your great saphenous vein flowing downhill, just like a river, the banks of the river get wide. When they can't hold anymore, it overflows into creeks and tributaries. Well, just like the veins, when the, the blood is flowing downhill in these saphenous veins, the banks of the vein get wide and overflows into branches going off into your skin. These branches usually are under the skin first and they don't actually start to bulge for several years. So by the time you see someone with bulging veins, it's been there for quite a while. So let's talk about swelling. The one thing about swelling I have to tell everyone that comes into my clinic is there's about 200 things that cause swelling. Dr. Bartholomew already mentioned a few of them. So um, swelling is a big thing with, with venous disease. Sadly, with lipedema, when you have your veins treated, your swelling usually does not change. So uh, especially the lipedema patients, I, I tell them, please do not expect a whole lot of improvement in your swelling because I just can't really tell you about that. But the swelling that does happen, usually with venous disease, is pitting edema. And I'm just gonna go through why it sort of happens. If you can imagine this pressure is in your veins at the end of the day, your veins are swollen like a, like a uh, balloon. The body tries to equilibrate that pressure because the pressure is greater in the veins than it is in the tissue. So it tries to equilibrate that pressure and some of that fluid leaks out of the vein into the tissue. 
That's where the swelling comes from. Then you go to bed at night, you raise your leg, that vein empties out with gravity and the body tries to accommodate the other direction. It tries to move that pressure now from the tissue back into the vein and it pulls some of that fluid with it. So at night, it re-enters your circulation, gets filtered by your kidneys. That's why most of you, if you have venous disease, I think, sometimes have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. But anyway, um, this will still happen when you have your venous disease, but it doesn't really, I mean, your treatments, but it doesn't really affect the swelling in um, lipedema. The one thing I tell patients is the swelling is, is worse at the end of the day, it's better in the morning, and if you're waking up with swelling, that's not from your veins. So all of this pressure in these veins from all of this downhill flow um, really causes pressure, like I tell them, at the bottom of the waterfall, the pressure is the highest. And when you think of this pressure flowing downhill in your ankle, it's causing pressure on the lower part of your leg first in your ankle and then your lower part of your leg, just like the pressure in the waterfall. Well, all of that pressure in the veins gets transmitted into the tissue causing inflammation in your tissue. And that inflammation, we think, is what is responsible for these other things that you find. The venous stasis is the redness and the inflammation in the tissue. It causes the flebectasia that you've heard about before on the inner ankle. The pigmentation is also from the pressure and inflammation and the venous ulcers. The thing about venous ulcers, they're not from a cut on the inside. They're from, I mean, not from the outside. They're from pressure inside, pushing out from the inside. So how do we diagnose and treat venous disease? Well, when you come to an office, you get an extensive history. We ask about your symptoms and do they happen at the, at the beginning of the day or are they at the end of the day? Um, we get a family history and do a physical exam and do an ultrasound. When we do an ultrasound, what we're doing is to see if you have venous reflux. We have to squeeze your leg because it's the only way for us to push the blood out of the vein. Then we give about a half a second for those valves to close and then the ultrasound machine listens. Do you have flow coming downhill? If, you, if after about a half a second you still have flow coming downhill, then you probably have venous reflux. We also measure the banks of the vein to see if you have venous dilation. So what are the treatment goals? Well, our treatment goal is to decrease inflammation and decrease pressure. We're trying to stop this from happening and give you this all day long. And I think you guys can understand that this is gonna help take away some of those symptoms. So what kind of treatments are there? Well, there's conservative treatment and definitive treatment. And conservative treatment will give you temporary relief, but it's the things that you can do at home to help. And it's compression, exercise, the non-steroidals, some of the vasoactive medications and herbs and leg elevation. And the definitive treatments are the procedures that you can usually have done. And these are usually all done in an outpatient setting. So with conservative treatment, you all know about compression. And we usually recommend 20 to 30 millimeters, um, depends on the person, because I don't want them left in the drawer like you've already heard. Well, when you get the strength of compression, you're getting about 100% of that at the ankle, about 70% at the calf, and 40% in the thigh. That graduation in compression is actually driving the fluid and blood out of the leg so that when you're wearing compression, your vein is, um, is smaller and has, is not holding as much blood. But sadly, when you take it off, it goes right back. Now, in lipedema, it is important to not just use thigh height. Most of you do need to use compression in your upper thigh and in your truncal area as well. So exercise is really important. Just walking is important. It's really utilizing that calf foot pump and elevation just because it helps use gravity to drain it out. So what are the definitive treatments? What are the procedures that we do? Well, let's go back to that great and small saphenous vein. Because remember, we are trying to um, improve the flow in those veins. And if you can remember that these are like a river flowing downhill, we want to sort of close the river so we can shut that pressure off. When we do these treatments, they're usually called ablation. And ablation is just another word for close. And most of the time, we start at the top of the vein, and we will um, clean off your leg, find the vein with an ultrasound, we will activate the device, pull that device back, and melt that vein while closed. And this is how we close these veins. There, when to treat um, with lipedema and dercums is um, 
basically I put this in here because I wanted you to look at the backward flow. The backward flow does get worse with time, with age, but I want you to look at this 65. We can find reflux somewhere in a vein in 65 year olds, 75% of the time. About 30% of those patients are gonna have some signs of medical dis disorder or some uh, effects from that. But it doesn't mean that you have to treat everybody. So if someone finds venous reflux in your veins, do you need treatment? Absolutely not. Not all venous reflux needs treatment. And even if you have some early medical signs from it, you don't need treatment as well. So when should you treat? Well, I think that we should look at these, the symptoms, the skin changing, and the liposuction. So as we talked before, as your vein gets heavier and heavier at the end of the day, if you really do feel that you need to get off your legs and say, just give me 10 minutes before I go do those dishes, I just need five minutes before I go fold those towels, and this is really starting to affect your activities of daily living, then this would be an indication to do the treatments for veins. Now, lipedema will not improve with vein treatments at all. Some of the symptoms can if they are related to veins. Now, most of these symptoms are also related to lipedema, but you usually have them all day long. So what I tell people is they still may be present, but they're gonna be significantly less at the end of the day, and I usually tell them to expect about 20 to 30%. We do not have the studies for me to quote on this. This is just in my uh, opinion and my expertise. So remember, our goals of treatment, we wanna decrease the pressure to decrease the inflammation and decrease the redness. So when you do a treatment with venous stasis, it's gonna remove that, that, um, that um, inflammation and redness. So this woman went to the beach and got tanned, but you could, uh, it is the same person. Then when we do these treatments, we can close these ulcers about 85 to 90% of the time, and the skin changes do improve. But I tell them to expect about a 50% improvement because some of these skin changes are, are, are permanent. Now, remember the misconception is that most varicose veins are under the skin. So I think another indication, other than symptoms and skin changes, is perhaps if you're considering liposuction. And because most varicose veins are under the skin and you can't see them, this black tube, vein, uh, blood shows up black. So this black tube that you see here is actually a varicose vein under the skin. So you may wanna just consult with your surgeon before you have liposuction because if you're like the, your tissue's on the left, it may not be as messy as if your tissue's on the right. So it just your surgeon would recommend that if you wanted to do that. So can um, treatments make lipedema and DERCOMs worse? Absolutely they can. And it seems to be provider specific. I don't see it in my practice, but others do. So how do we predict? How do we select? We just don't know. We need those studies to be done. We don't know exactly why, but several of my colleagues, we all agree with a couple of things that I wanna share with you. We talked about that ablation, where there's two types. There's thermal and non-thermal. When we do a thermal ablation, we thread the device up. We have to numb up the tissue around that vein with anesthetic, all right? Well, these thermal ablations, that heat and inflammation can affect structures next to it, like nerves and uh, other arteries if they're there. So perhaps if th with the extensive network of lymphatics around these veins, perhaps if they're not using enough anesthetic that that could be causing damage to these veins. So then why don't we use a non-thermal technique, all right? There's mechanical and adhesive. With the mechanical, we thread it up. It has a little wire, it rotates, and it rotates about 3,500 3, RPMs. So as we pull it, it scratches the vein, and we use the sclerosant there to help close it. Then there's an adhesive device that we thread it up, and we deliver, it's sort of like a super glue in the vein, and we compress that vein as we go along, and we close that. Neither one of these need anesthesia. There's no injury to adjacent structures. It doesn't damage the nerves or the lymphatics. So why don't we just do this on all the patients with lipedema? Well, most private insurance companies don't cover this. So even though they're both FDA approved, they're not available to be covered by insurance. Fortunately, most Medicare policies in the US use, do approve these, but every Medicare policy is regional and some don't. So your, your uh, provider would know if they are. We do need more studies, and fortunately, there's about a half a dozen doctors that love lipedema, and they are willing to do these studies, so hopefully I can come with answers next year instead of just ideas. Another thing is, is that 
there's a lot of these veins that are uh, left that untreated after uh, treatment, and perhaps we need to use uh, sclerotherapy uh, to close all of these veins as well. So one of the things I just want to throw out there is we know that pressure in the large veins can cause the symptoms in the tributaries, and that can cause inflammation leading to these skin change. And one of the things I'd really like to sort of better understand is could this pressure, this venous hypertension, be transmitted into the microcirculation, circu the extensive capillaries, causing inflammation into the interstitium, the glycocalyx, the lymphatics, and possibly affect lipedema? We don't know. So I'm going to leave you with this. My father was a physician. He was an orthopedic surgeon. He took care of pain. And he used to always tell me this, and I'm going to pass it to you. Of all the pleasures life can gain, it is not in treasure but relief from pain. Thank you.